very good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the ISS book discussion on governance by stealth, the Ministry of Home Affairs and the making of the Indian state. Before we proceed with the event proper, I would appreciate it if you could mute your microphones and switch off your videos throughout the session. If you have any questions to share with the panelists, please forward them via the Zoom chat. Our moderator will consolidate the questions for the panelists to answer during Q&A time later. This afternoon, we are delighted to have with us the author of the book, Professor Subrata Mitra, Emeritus Professor of Political Science at the Heidelberg University in Germany. Joining him will be two distinguished panelists. First, we have Professor Kati Bashpai, the Director of Center of, on Asia and Globalization and Wilma Professor of Asian Studies at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy here at NUS. Second panelist is Professor Haria Bhattacharya, Professor of Political Science at the University of Barwan in India. Chairing today's session is Mr. Vinod Rai, Distinguished Visiting Research Fellow at ISS and the former Comptroller and Auditor General with the Government of India. To start with the proceedings, I would like to invite Associate Professor Ipal Singh Siva, the Director of ISS, to deliver his opening remarks. Dr. Ipal, please. Thank you, Claudia. Good morning and good afternoon to our distinguished panelists and participants, depending on which part of the world you are joining us from. I'm delighted to welcome you all to what I'm sure will be an enriching and stimulating discussion. On behalf of the Institute of South Asian Studies, I would like to congratulate Professor Subrata Mitra on the publication of his new book, Governance by Stout, the Ministry of Home Affairs and the Making of the Indian State. Professor Mitra, has a strong and active relationship with ISS. He was the director of the Institute of South Asian Studies from 2015 to 2018. I'm happy to add that the work on the book being discussed today was done at ISS with research assistance and insights from colleagues on the workings of Indian ministries. Professor Mitra, of course, finished the book when he returned to Heidelberg. So ISS is indeed pleased to be part of the development of this book. Needless to say, we are also delighted to organize this book discussion with him and our esteemed panelists. Together, they will delve deep into the book and explore how it contributes to our understanding of the history and politics of the Ministry of Home Affairs and more broadly, governmental structures in India. Despite the central role, of, central role played by the Ministry of Home Affairs in the development of the modern Indian state, it has been insufficiently studied. This book is thus timely and important. Professor Mitra takes the reader on a journey through the ministry's multiple roles, functions, and the different stages of its organizational evolution. One of the subheadings in chapter one is entitled Raj to Swaraj, Poachers into Gamekeepers. I felt that this simply encapsulates his aim to trace the transformation of the colonial home department which was of course designed to ensure the stability of colonial structures into an institution that has fundamentally shaped and maintained the independent state of India. It has done this through, as the title of this book indicates, governance by stealth, or the use of, mini use of minimum force to generate maximum order. The armory, so to speak, of the Ministry of Home Affairs includes mechanisms of oversight, intervention, intelligence, and the authority to deploy paramilitary forces. The Ministry of Home Affairs is also an outstanding example of institutional resilience and an adaptive bureaucratic apparatus. Its organizational evolution reflects continuity and adaptation in the face of rapid change, intra-regional competition, ideological shifts, and constitutional challenges. Of course, the position, independence, and authority of the Ministry of Home Affairs has been itself impacted upon by political dispositions. This book weaves together archival research and personal accounts to recount the struggles of policymaking and politics faced by the ministry and its employees. Its in-depth examinations of the ministry reveal important political norms as well as the astute workings of the civil servants in the face of political crises and conflicts. Like all of you, I look forward to hearing the views of the panelists. Mr. Vinod Rai, Distinguished Visiting Research Fellow at ISIS, has kindly agreed to chair the session. 
given, a, given his experience as the former controller in the Indian government, he is no doubt the ideal person for this task. I'm equally grateful, grateful to our esteemed panelists, Professor Kanti Bajpai and Professor Harihar Bhattacharya for joining us for today's book discussion and to share with us their thoughts on this important topic. I wish all of you an enriching session. Thank you for joining us and over to you, Mr. Rai. Uh, thank you, Iqbal. So very good of you to have given this introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this book discussion on governance by stealth by Professor Subrata Mitra. This is about the Ministry of Home Affairs and the making of the Indian state. Uh, the book, as a person who has had firsthand experience in the functioning of the Indian state and role of the Ministry of Home Affairs, I would most hesitant, unhesitatingly say that this book is a landmark contribution to the literature available researching the evolution of the Indian state and how governance, norms were created and recreated to suit multiple hues of government that came to occupy the seat of so-called power. It is the fruit of painstaking research done pouring through thousands of pages in the archives of India. But the result is an excellently crafted manuscript which captures how the ministry transformed over the 50 years of India's independence. Incidentally, the Ministry of Home Affairs, a successor to the colonial home department under British rule, is a remarkable example of institutional resilience. How a colonial institution, whose key task was to hold Indian nationalism at bay, became the chief architect uh, <clears throat> of the post-colonial state and nation is one of the main questions which Dr. Mitra's book responds to. It explains the salience displayed by the ministry and also its resilience in terms of its singular expertise in enabling governance by stealth, implying the use of minimum force to generate maximum order. And I dare say that over years, this has been achieved through a deft combination of regulation and self-regulation and creation of rules that embody the sense of identity and deeply held values of the citizen, citizenry, which are implemented in a manner that is fair and accountable. The constitution of India, as you all know, recognizes the key role of the ministry in the entire process by formally endowing it an advisory role in these critical functions. These points are so beautifully illustrated in this book through an analysis of the appropriate evidence based on declassified files of the Ministry of Home Affairs, correspondences, biographies, and interviews. Much credit goes to the Home Ministers, the home, first Home Minister of India, Sadar Vallabhai Patel, who can justifiably be referred to as the architect who created the foundation for the role and functioning of the Ministry of Home Affairs during the founding years of the Republic. He was instrumental in creating the All India Services who have played a stellar role in setting standards for independent and accountable bureaucracy and creating an architecture for good administration. The role of Latter-day ministers such as C. Rajagopalachari, Govind Vallabh Pant, Lal Bahadur Shastri, Gulzari Lal Nanda, and Mr. Y.B. Chawan in creating a capable institution of accountable institution vastly strengthened the role of these earlier gentlemen. The MHA has evolved into an exceedingly important organization. And I would sincerely hope that Dr. Mitra, who has developed a rare and deep understanding of this organization, further researches and analyzes its role in depth over the turn of the millennium also. It will be very interesting to see how the ministry has traversed over the last 70 odd years. Without saying more, I would take this opportunity of having Dr. Mitra himself introduce the book, introduce the subject and give us some kind of a curtain raiser on what this, what this book contains. 
Professor Mitra, may I call upon you to make the presentation, please? Professor Mitra. Good morning, and thank you very, very much, Prof. Bal and Mr. Vinod Rai, for the very kind words you have uh, spoken about uh, my research and about the book. Um, when I uh, was very young and had just started writing, I had a very tough mentor. And when I write something and send it to him, then go to him for a conversation and start by talking about what I've said, he would stop me. No, Shubrata, you have written, your book should talk about itself. <laughs> you shouldn't have to summarize the book all over again. So I will stay with the warning of mentor. And in, rather than summarizing the book, I'll tell you a couple of things which I have not said in the book. Uh, first and foremost, the book is attributed to me, but it is very much the result of a collective effort. And I would be remiss if I didn't say, Prof. Bal, how grateful I am to ISAS, first of all, for giving me excellent research assistance, which helped me dredge through the 209 secret files from the archives and also about 70 fat annual reports and, and, and. I was sort of dredging through these tons of sand looking for a few nuggets and that would not have been possible if I were all on my own nor would I have had the access to the movers and shakers of India had it not been for Mr. Binod Rai, who opened the door for me and for colleagues of that time who spoke to me in confidence about what they knew. Those were people and that is the very important contribution of ISAS to my own research who sat at the sort of uh, at the high tables of Indian administration and diplomacy and I could get their insights and thank you so very much for that. The other thing that I have to say is that I had not at all intended to write about governance by stealth, which is maximum order with minimum force. My intention when I started was much more simple. I just wanted to write a book an institutional history of the Ministry of Home Affairs. And that was born, that intention was born entirely out of envy. I've always envied historians for the confidence with which they talk about what they have to talk. And as, a, as an undergraduate in political science, I was also talked to about Indian ministries, administration, and um, commissions and so on. But somehow my teachers did not have the same confidence in what they were talking about as I found when I read books about the evolution of Indian institutions from people like um, uh, Chris Bailey or uh, B.B. Mishra, historians who were talking about India's institutions. So I said to myself, why is it that when you are reading about India, it's a little bit like you read colonial history and colonial institutions, and it's a bit like wading into the sea. You're on firm ground, then suddenly the continental shelf drops off and you're lost. That is when you see Indian political scientists talking about India's political institutions, and you get the feeling these are like big ocean liners or little dinghies floating on the surface of India without any deep roots into India's political soil. And that makes you a little unsure about what you are reading about, what you are talking about, if you see what I mean. So I wanted to take a leaf out of the historian's book and do an institutional history of the Ministry of Home Affairs. And that is what I had in mind, that's why I had done all that archival research when I went to Singapore. But why Home Ministry? That also has a little history behind it. 2002, I was doing uh, a, an interview 
in the Ministry of Home Affairs, if you can see that building. And I was uh, talking to a very uh, erudite gentleman, a high officer in the ministry, about uh, what they do, and he was extremely evasive. And that was a bit disappointing, because the questions I was asking had to do with order, welfare, and identity. Because I had a theory that governance is possible if and only if there is good self-policing, because no state can have as many policemen as men. So how is self-policing done in India? Or for that matter, if you do not get what you think is legitimately yours, your basic needs, you will steal. But if something is done by the way of, um, by the way of uh, strategic reform and food, clothing and shelter to a minimum degree are made available, then instead of stealing, the poachers become gamekeepers. So how does India do this strategic reform? And then I was also talking about the whole concept of sacredness. I mean, there are some things which are so important, so sacred, like your own, your own dignity, that of your wife, your daughter, your child, your gods, your language, your religion. If these things are offended, then all hell breaks loose. Because you feel if you don't kill or if you die, then you'd be dying in a very, very painful way. So how does India protect the sacred? But my interviewee was not really forthcoming. So when I finished that research and I did publish the book finally, and that was uh, the precursor to what I decided to do. So I said to myself, this gentleman is not really take, talking to me in confidence because I have just come without any introduction. So I would go to the archive where things are different because in an archival uh, context you see into files which are written in a different way. I am a civil servant son, I have grown up with files and I know anything that the state does has to be written down somewhere, a colonial practice. So I thought in the files they would be expressing their opinions frankly enough for without the fear of being disciplined. And that is how ideas would evolve all the way until they become bills. And those bills, if they are passed by the parliament, will become laws. And they will become the basic fundamental rules of the game of India's politics. That was the reason I went into archival research and did all that. Then comes Singapore. And something about Singapore told me, no, 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 I need a real title for the book. It should be Governance by Stealth. I mean, three years in that country, I have not seen any violent demonstrations, riots. And then I looked up the policing and I found that the number of policemen per million in Singapore is even lower than India. And of course, much lower than the United States. So I said to myself, let's enough history, let's go back to political science and ask, how does India manage this governance by stealth? Where did India learn it from? And how does it go on? And when does it fail? That is the basic background to the book. Our chairman of the panel and uh, Prof. Iqbal have talked about the basic findings. I will only touch upon a couple of them to alert you to what was going on. Now, here is a story. Under colonial rule, the Home Department was a protector of colonial administration and therefore it was locked in battle against Indian nationalism. So that's the, that's the first puzzle. How come the same Home Department, which then becomes the Home Ministry, becomes the protector of the Indian nation, protector of India's internal administration. How does the poacher become the gamekeeper? For that, 
I was fortunate to find an interview with Mr. Iyengar. Mr. Iyengar was uh, one of the last home, uh, last secretaries of the home department. And he's being interviewed and he's being asked, so Mr. Iyengar, what is your job? He said, my job under British rule was to look after our prisoners, uh, Mr. Nehru and Mr. Patel, and make sure that they did not get any uh, literature or any visits which would corrupt them. Uh, today, I work for them. That is the story of how these civil servants turned around and became the civil servants of independent India under the leadership of Ballabhai Patel. And that is how um, we have analyzed a few uh, autobiographies and I've shown how towards the end of colonial rule, uh, the ICS was Indianized to a very large degree and members of the ICS were already trying to cultivate leaders of the Indian independence who they knew would become big ministers. But after independence, the British officers left mostly, some went to Pakistan, others went home. Many Muslim civil servants also left. So that the code that was left under the leadership of Patel became a very important uh, element in the steel frame that would continue to hold India together. The second thing I have to say, because I should not take too long, was my identification of seven norms which if they are adhered to would generate the context where governance by stealth would be possible. And I will simply read out those seven. There has to be elite consensus which is synchronized thinking of top decision makers both political and administrative. The second norm is search for the middle ground because the Home Ministry is not just the Home Minister, it is also the Home Secretary. Now there's a little bit of a paradox. The Minister is a politician and has to be partisan by definition and the civil servant is a professional neutral civil servant. He is there to serve whoever becomes the Minister. So how do the two work together? That is the beauty of the system and I am showing how in India when the minister changes, the secretary does not automatically change and vice versa. So they help one another out. The minister briefs the new secretary what the problems are or the secretary briefs the new minister what the problems are and they search to find a middle ground. What is the middle ground? I'm using a concept of political zealotry. A new minister wants to change the whole world and the secretary tells him, no minister, not so fast. You have to take this, 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 this into account. So they start negotiating and looking for a middle ground. Strategic information and intelligence. Uh, in the book, I have used uh, the concept of octopus from an American um, journalist called Wells Hengen who defined the home ministry as an octopus which has its tentacles everywhere. I have not used uh, a metaphor that I would like to use if I were to redo the book. I would instead use the concept of the heart in the body. The heart which pumps out fresh blood and pumps in blood which needs to be oxygenated which like a, uh, like a mechanism sucks in intelligence from all over the country and when a decision is taken by the PMO and the Prime Minister and the Cabinet Committee, it then makes sure that they are implemented. That is how strategic information and intelligence is collected and that supply is very important for governance by stealth. Then there has to be trust which is empathy for value and interest of the subject on the part of the holders of power then effective and transparent use of credible sanctions. What is credible sanction? Credible sanction is to let people know 
that there is a hammer somewhere. If negotiation doesn't help, the hammer will fall. That credibility is very important for people also to look for the middle ground. And institutional cohesion and accountability. I'm talking about a Troika, the Prime Minister, the Home Secretary and uh, the Home Minister and the Home Secretary had to hold together. If they don't, and I'm talking in the book how during the, the announcement of the emergency was done in a manner that didn't respect this Troika. Similarly, the Troika didn't work together when the Babri Mosque was demolished and the Troika didn't work together when 1984 anti-Sikh riots took place in Delhi. And the most difficult of the norms is control over public space and public culture. The British colonial rulers were very, very keen on this. They knew that they were very few and the country had a Hindu majority and, 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 a, and a difficult Muslim minority and they had to make sure that the public sphere would remain neutral, that the state would not side with either side. And that neutrality became very difficult to maintain once India becomes independent. That is where Nehru comes in and the whole mechanism of holding the state a little above competing religions, religious rivalries. And I'm showing how the independent government took over a British institution to maintain temples called there were some boards and how the independent government made sure that state control over pub, over religious property will continue but religion itself will be self-governing and that is how the that control was maintained uh, but later maybe in the discussion we will talk about how that control has become much more problematic today i will not go into what holds india together as long as the governance by stealth operates and there the paramilitary plays a very important role is a specialty of uh, India's home ministry because the paramilitary are not under the control of the defense ministry but the paramilitary is controlled by the home ministry but not home ministry alone like in Kashmir today they all operate together and to end I would simply say we have found in the home ministry great pupils but also great teachers they have learned what was given to them they've used it they've reused it reused it and when there was a need for it they have in relentlessly innovated that is how they have become great survivors i will leave it there and uh, come back once uh, we have had our panelists and further questions thank you all for your attention Professor Mitra, thank you very much for that lovely introduction and giving us a peep into your effort. I must say, very perceptive, very incisive too. And uh, the reason why you have chosen the Ministry of Home Affairs, whatever may have been the reasoning for you, it definitely is one of those ministries in the Government of India where everybody looks at it with a sense of awe. It's a ministry which is very holistic in a large number of ways that has its finger in practically every institution that is going around. And your illustration of how the home department, which was a poacher in some ways, ultimately becomes a king, king keeper is really a wonderful illustration of how the entire thing has transformed. Uh, those seven norms that you have identified, they are absolutely the key thing in the entire functioning of the ministry. Anyway, I'm sure the audience who have heard you would like to get a better insight into it all. Now I will switch on to Professor Kanti Bajpai to give us his uh, analysis of the uh, introduction uh, of the book. Professor Kanti Bajpai, over to you, please. You know, thank you very much, and Subrata, great to see you again and to hear you uh, give a, a, a sort of a, a biographical, as it were, way into uh, your work and and what uh, led up to it and uh, how you proceeded. Uh, and of course, in your usual 
a very uh, 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 genial way you've you've kind of uh, given us the uh, sort of core of of some of the uh, of the arguments. Um, I specialize in international relations, not so much in India's domestic politics. But so I think for me, uh, the book, uh, in a sense, uh, is uh, yeah, is a huge uh, value add, and uh, uh, I certainly learned a lot from it. And um, uh, I have about eight or ten minutes, so I'm not gonna. Uh, I've got a bunch of notes here, but I'm just gonna try and focus on about three or four points um, before I hand over to Professor Bhattacharya. Um, I think the first point I um, I wanted to make about the book uh, is not about the book per se, but uh, about something that both Vinod and Subrata alluded to, which is uh, the increasing uh, um, kind of output in India uh, on contemporary India, sort of contemporary history, um, really begun in a sense by uh, historians themselves, obviously, um, such as um, uh, Ram Guha and, uh, and others that, that have followed in his wake. In my field, international relations, I think a lot of Srinath Raghavan, for instance. Um, these are scholars uh, who've gone into the archives, which the Indian government has increasingly uh, begun, uh, begun to make available. Um, and uh, I think, you know, that was a, a vital kind of, of, of decision taken by uh, the Indian government. Uh, for a long time, I think, uh, many of us who do either foreign policy or, or domestic politics were waiting for, you know, a more fulsome kind of opening of, of the archives. Uh, and it started to happen. Um, and so I think that's laid the, the groundwork. And uh, it's fabulous that uh, Subrata and his researchers uh, went into it. Um, and we're seeing now, you know, a whole bunch of studies coming out uh, on parliament and parliamentary debates and the constitution making process. Uh, there have been books on the Indian courts and their functioning. Uh, of course, Indian foreign policy. Um, um, uh, Subrata's uh, colleague Amit Das Gupta in Germany has written a book on the origins of the Indian Foreign Service from the Department of Health and Lands and, and, uh, and, and a couple of other uh, departments that featured uh, KPS Menon and uh, Subhimal Dat and uh, GS Bajpai uh, as precursors to the Foreign Service. And, of course, Vinit Thakur's work in Leiden also on the origins of Indian foreign policy. Uh, these I'm more familiar with, but the studies also of the Indian military, uh, of course, going back to Professor Steve Cohen, my former supervisor, Steve Wilkinson at Yale and, and others. Um, and of course, you know, what we're more familiar with, I think is um, uh, very interesting uh, biographies of leaders. I mean, Nehru, of course, in, in massive doses, but uh, Sardar Patel, of course, uh, Mahatma Gandhi uh, too in, in huge numbers, but people like Sardar Patel, Indra Gandhi, uh, other ministers, uh, other prime ministers, uh, Narasimha Rao, uh, Vajpayee, Atul Bihari Vajpayee, Mr. Manmohan Singh, uh, perhaps has uh, not received quite uh, that much uh, uh, attention yet, uh, although the Sanjay Baru's book. And of course, uh, you know, um, there are the reminiscences and and so on, a foreign service officers, uh, uh, et cetera, and great civil servants, uh, such as VP Menon, who worked with Sadar Patel to bring about the integration of the state. Uh, I mean, I could go on, but uh, it seems to me that, you know, we're at a, a, a tremendous moment in India's academic uh, life. Um, and in a sense, it's public culture where there's now a, a kind of scholarly treatment increasingly of institutions, of key figures, uh, of processes in Indian uh, governance and, and politics. And uh, this book, I mean, really should find uh, a, a vital place in that library, and I'm sure it will be. Uh, it's a trailblazer, uh, certainly for studies of other departments and ministries uh, in the government of India. So I'm just gonna make three points, uh, I think that really struck me out of the book. Uh, there's much more I could say, but I think these three uh, really spoke to me uh, very directly and uh, immediately. I mean, the first point is one that has been made and I go along with it completely, but I guess I never quite appreciated the extent of it until I read this book, which is that MHA has its fingers in every governance pie. I mean, its reach and remit have expanded um, and uh, uh, it shows that MHA is not just responsible for order in a narrow sense, that is preventing violence and civil disobedience, uh, uh, up to and including secessionism and rebellion against 
the prevailing norms and institutions as well as elected governments. But it shows that it's, uh, MHA's imprint is on virtually every aspect of Indian political and social life, including economic affairs and foreign policy. So I think, I guess I had not appreciated that. Um, I did see it in a narrower sense as the kind of custodian of normal internal order, policing, intelligence, day-to-day -day surveillance, uh, kind of, you know, uh, the broad outlines of, of, of kind of um, uh, home affairs and domestic order, but not the very deep, as he, as he puts it, octopus-like, uh, you know, uh, uh, tentacles that go into virtually every uh, thing. I mean, the home ministry, the Ministry of Home Affairs, it reaches into every home. Let's put it that way. I mean, I think as no other ministry does. And I think for me, certainly, that was a kind of a revelation. Um, I had not appreciated the extent to which uh, MHA is such a central, massive, all-encompassing kind of a ministry. By all-encompassing, I mean its tentacle, tentacles, when it wants to, can reach out you know, uh, to every corner and every household. Um, so that's the first point. I think the massive kind of presence of MHA, which at the same time, uh, as Subhra shows, uh, you know, it, it, it's not apparent, and that's its great success. Uh, that that's the stealth element. Uh, that it does all this uh, without the citizenry being aware of each and everything it does. I dare say every minister doesn't know. Uh, I mean, the home ministers probably do, but. Uh, other cabinet ministers uh, probably don't know the extent to which uh, MHA has, uh, has an impact and shapes uh, public and even our private lives. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, so that's the first point. The second really important point that I got from it uh, is about the continuity from colonial times. Now, of course, I mean, in a sense, this is the case in almost all post-colonial, post-imperial countries, uh, except for some revolutionary states, such as, let's say, China after 1949. I mean, I think most countries in Africa and Asia will testify to this kind of post-colonial, you know, uh, shift over um, of norms and practices. Um, of course, they, they do get modified and changed as time goes on. So um, I think India is certainly part of that. But, um, and, and to that extent, I mean, I would say that um, I wasn't quite as surprised by this kind of post-colonial continuity as perhaps uh, Subrata was. Um, but I mean, my own grandfather, G.S. Bajpai went from one of these civil servants of the ICS under uh, the colonial rule, I think they were fairly seamlessly uh, working under Nehru as the first head of the foreign service uh, in South Bloc. So um, I guess that part didn't surprise me as much, but what surprised me was and what distinguishes MHA maybe from its counterparts in uh, the rest of the world is just how subtle and clever its role has been in furthering democracy. So many Asian and African democracies collapsed uh, after the 1950s and 1960s, um, you know, and uh, India's did not. And um, it, some of it, the key features, not just electoral democracy, but some kind of, you know, secularism, uh, of uh, a very um, quick uh, and thoroughgoing uh, integration at one level um, and, and sort of peacemaking processes that occurred uh, where integration didn't necessarily happen immediately. You know, I mean, Subrata shows how, how well MHA performed that role um, with a kind of sense of mission that it was now serving a post-colonial democracy in a very variegated, uh, sometimes turbulent, uh, very diverse uh, country. Um, and we've got to remember that, I mean, there were British Indian states and then there were the princely states and their governance overlapped, but they were different. So there was integration at many, many levels that had to be done. Um, and over 70 years, under all kinds of challenges and circumstances, including challenges to democracy itself, um, MHA has very subtly and effectively um, uh, managed uh, to deliver on maintaining this diversity, giving it space, giving it play, uh, and yet, of course, regulating, uh, allowing uh, the noise of democracy not to overwhelm democracy. Um, uh, there are challenges, uh, there have been challenges in the past, there are challenges ahead of us. And, and of course, uh, I think further research will show that 
not everything the MHA did was always for the good in that respect, but then, you know, uh, who would hold any uh, ministry or department uh, to such perfection? Uh, so that was my second big point. I think that uh, I really had not thought of the MHA so much as a standard bearer of, of a kind of a post-colonial democracy. Uh, I thought of it more as, uh, you know, someone who would wrap you on the knuckles, uh, poke into your affairs, um, and maybe even throw you into jail if you misbehave. But um, uh, its role was much more subtle and uh, emancipatory and I think positive than that. Um, um, so, and the third big point I think that I got from it was, is related to the second, um, which is, you know, how it dealt with the diversity issue. Uh, some years ago, um, I was invited to, uh, well, quite a long time ago, 20 years ago, to write a piece on how India managed its ethnic diversity, where ethnic is in the broadest sense, uh, uh, relates to all ascribed identities, religion, language, caste, tribes. And we know India is uh, perhaps the, uh, uh, the, the most diverse almost, in, if you add all those together. And my answer uh, was that a combination of four or five elements uh, uh, you know, delivered uh, a working peace system, if you like, within India, internal security. Uh, and the, what were those elements? There was, of course, the promise of constitutionalism. It wasn't that, you know, constitutional order and rules were always observed, but it was the promise of constitutionalism to various groups, uh, such that if they had grievances, there was recourse to the courts uh, to rule bound uh, judgments and correctives uh, if, they, if their diversity, if their identity and so on were, were not being respected. Uh, second, uh, the redistribution of, of uh, wealth uh, and the promise of economic development, I think were vital in managing India's great diversity. So that uh, these various ethnic groups uh, could all dream and imagine that their lives would be better, that they would get an increasing part of the pie and that they would be lifted up from the bottom as the economy developed. The third element I think was really very crucial was the devolution of power in a layered federalism, not just between the center and the states, but increasingly with article uh, 73 and so on, down to much lower levels. Uh, and then we had groupings of states, the, uh, the various councils of, uh, of states, the Southern Council of Southern States and the Northeast Council of the Seven or Eight Northeastern States and so on. I mean, that never worked very much except in the Northeast, but it was again the promise that there were these layers of the devolution of power. Um, the next one was group rights. So we have all kinds of group rights in India based on religion, on language, on caste and tribes. I won't go into all of those, but I think the book does in show where these, uh, where the Ministry of Home Affairs played a, a vital role in uh, crafting those group rights and implementing them. And lastly, of course, as was alluded to by both uh, Vinod and I think uh, Subrata, was you know the possibility of the hammer but the calibrated use of force when no other option was available. So I think that you will get this in uh, Mitra's book far better than I portrayed it from the inside. And I think, uh, again, when I wrote that piece, I didn't appreciate how much the home ministry uh, would have played a role in that. So I think, again, um, the book is a revelation to me in the extent to which civil servants and the ministers there in a partnership with the Prime Minister of India and, I suppose the people, uh, and other cabinet ministers crafted this brilliant system of, you know, uh, for internal security and, and, and dealing with India's great diversity. Um, and I think uh, the, the book shows it in great detail, which, of course, I was not able to do many years ago, and all credit to, to the, that, that account in the book. So I'm just going to stop there. I think these were three very big things I got out of the book. Uh, if I get a chance, I'll come back on a few other points later in the discussion, but I think my 10 minutes is done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Bajpai. <clears throat> uh, I do agree with you entirely that public debates have become so much more enriched now that we have opened up our archives and lots of documents have come out, biographies, formation of the states and various other things, which were probably being handed out by word of mouth has now become a reality. Uh, and uh, academic, academic narr narrative has become so much more enriched. 
but Ministry of Home Affairs in a large number of ways has been a key keeper of the Indian democracy. It's a crucible, it nurtures, somewhere it disrupts also. As you very rightly said, the tentacles that it brings about, but the devolution of power, whether it's the Northeast, whether it's JNK, whether it's Hyderabad or Goa, whatever it is, but ultimately the fountainhead becomes this very ministry. And I think that has been very beautifully brought out by Professor Mitra in his book, but then one has to read the book and it is the first of its kind. Now I will pass on to Professor Bhattacharya. Bhattacharya, Professor Bhattacharya, we'd love to hear your version of having gone through this book and what you get out of it. On to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm very pleased <clears throat> to be invited. Uh, for me, uh, it is not uh, that easy to, uh, to be outside of the book in a sense that uh, I was also closely associated uh, with his uh, making. I mean, I, I read uh, several drafts uh, and Subrato uh, as my you know, elder brother and myself, uh, his younger brother, uh, I mean, we both had the seizures. He had a big seizures, I had a small seizure. And we would, you know, so the seizure each that you cut down, he, then he also cuts down. So uh, I was, in, in a way, uh, very much you know, uh, part of the making of the book. And uh, uh, today, what I'm going to say, uh, I mean, I try, try to say is about how can I uh, say something from outside? Uh, because I was already inside of the book. Uh, I, I read all the chapters several, several times. I made comments, discussed. Uh, I believe that it is a, I mean, finally, finally, it has, it is a majestic book. Uh, I mean, Subrato Babasa Mitra, he, he has been uh, basically a political scientist based on surveys, survey research, rational choice, mathematics. He has been so good at that, being trained in Rochester. Uh, but when, you, when we, we read this book, uh, it, it amazes me because uh, uh, it says he, he's a storyteller, a storyteller in a majestic style, a uh, story of the making of the Indian state for more than 300 years. Uh, it's, it's amazing uh, the way he has gone into the uh, minute details about, uh, uh, about how, to in, how to hold India, India together, how to manage his diversity. Uh, this morning, I was looking at uh, some chapter where I, I was also you know, thrilled by how much, uh, how much detail he had, he had got in terms of the management of the uh, religious institution in Kerala uh, and the inner, inner, uh, inner discourse uh, 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 within the home ministry about how, how best to manage it and how the home ministry also agreed that let there be elections to the Kerala State Legislative Assembly and let them decide it. So the kind of stealth uh, that he, uh, that is the central theme of his book, one could read it, you know, in, in, in every pages, in every sections. Uh, and he had, he had shown that with detailed, you know, records from the uh, declassified documents from the Home Ministry. So uh, it's, that way it is a very fascinating book. The other thing I would like to say here in the, in the beginning is that uh, the book raises uh, very important challenging issues for comparative politics. Uh, I mean, he has referred to Charles Tilley's writings on the, on the state making in Europe. Uh, the story there was different. Uh, their state making took, took place in about 300 years how uh, late, from late feudalism to um, early capitalism, these big monarchies were built and it was all built by war. So there in Europe, war made the states. And Mitra also shows here how war also during the British period, how war also necessitated the making of the state in India. I mean, in, the, in this particular case, the home ministry. Uh, so there is also a, a scope, but the, the other uh, very crucial issue he mentioned and which I did not find already resolved 
uh, which is which is to be taken up further is the question of uh, uh, the indian case i mean is it is it a contrast uh, to the rest of the world in state making or is it uh, comparable uh, is there something uh, very special very particular about the indian behavior indian activities uh, towards the state or is it very different uh, so th these questions are very important uh, the other issue uh, which is very crucial to uh, comparative politics state making political theory uh, is uh, the question of center formation in india that has been historically the major problem uh, the moguls they tried but they failed everybody else failed uh, to uh, to make the center that there should be one center of power so that has been a question and uh, with with i mean british they, they of course tried and they made a tremendous you know uh, contribution uh, towards the making of a center but in mitra's book we find that the starting with the british uh, up to uh, up to now almost uh, that uh, such center formation has been a success story uh, and and even in in terms of federalism uh, on which i have some knowledge and expertise uh, even though india has been federalized uh, many uh, states have been created recreated then down the state level power has powers have been devolved but then not at the cost of the center so the, the the center formation the center formation has been a success story in india and his book also shows how uh, the center formation was possible uh, how cautiously the whole thing was handled and uh, and it has been a center a powerful center but at the same time also a federation so these two have been combined in a way uh, which uh, we do not find much parallels in world uh, contemporary world history uh, it's also amazing uh, to see uh, that uh, i mean uh, home ministry uh, maintains india's democracy that has been pointed out before by kanti and also in the book too how it uh, regulates elections i mean we are largest democracy is not only just in words or in procedure even if we say that it is it has a lot to do with procedural things uh, there the uh, the important role most important role is played not by the election commission actually uh, election commission's roles are all defined in the constitution but ultimately elections are held and there the regulatory function uh is performed by the uh, minister of home affairs so in terms of the uh, in terms of holding elections in terms of controlling major breakdowns of law and order although law and order is a set subject but then uh, we know uh, ultimately uh, the center has to intervene it has to send in send in the uh, paramilitary forces because state police are sometimes not capable of or 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 maybe uh, maybe uh, engage uh, in, in engage themselves in 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 uh, riots so uh, that also is uh, uh, is done by the home ministry the most important thing in in in, in ensuring governance uh, is of course the compliance that's the single word compliance that whether you make the law you make the rule but do you get the compliance did do the people comply with your rules and regulations and in a vast country like like india uh, of continental proportion this compliance is actually assured it is acquired uh, very efficiently by the ministry of home affairs uh, that is also another aspect uh, which uh, mitra has uh, uh, br brought in the book uh with um, detailed uh, reports evidences uh, the classified documents i mean i was but more i read about it i i believe that maybe one one uh, session small session uh, is not enough for enough to discuss the whole book i mean perhaps it would require in future perhaps a same a conference on on each of the chapter because each of the chapter contains 
I mean, uh, I mean, they are linked to the other chapter, but they are all independent in terms of the themes and the ideas uh, that he has brought in. Uh, there is another issue which I would like to uh, bring in is the question of uh, his uh, uh, his basic mantra, uh, basic you know theme in the book. Uh, governance by stealth, maximum order, minimum force. I mean, this will invite uh, uh, more questions because, uh, I mean, when we look at the budget, budgetary provision that Mitra provided in, in chapter nine, uh, there I was also quite, you know, intrigued uh, by the facts how billions of in rupees are spent on many of these uh, paramilitary forces. Is in the millions or in the, in billions, uh, so uh, it may not be true that uh, a force is, uh, I mean, minimum, because it's difficult to, of course, difficult to define uh, what is the minimum and what is the what is the maximum. Uh, order is maintained, that is true, but then uh, uh, we spent a lot of money on on maintaining those forces. But that is also a, a different different questions we can take up. Uh, later on, uh, there is uh, uh, th there are two other things, other as other issues uh, with which uh, after that I will finish for the moment. Uh, one is one is the question of uh, stateness, stateness itself. It's a theoretical question, uh, uh, and Mitro has referred to the debates on the issue. Now uh, the, the question is: uh, Home ministry it is home ministry is the state, if, if we say so. So uh, home ministry has 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 actually uh, increased India India's stateness. Uh, that is that is true. Uh, he has also pointed out the failure failure of the home ministry during the emergency uh, and other 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 difficult times. Now this is also quite interesting that the same same home ministry, which was the state uh, that was simply bypassed during the declaration of the emergency, but home ministry had to handle things after that. Now the important important question that remains here is after Indira Gandhi came back in 1980, and uh, did the stateness? I mean the stateness was of course uh, was very high. At the, at the time of the emergency, but uh, did it really increase, or uh, did Indira Gandhi actually made the state stateness uh, took took the state to a higher level, more powerful, uh, given the various repressive laws which have been in force uh, since then, uh, and, and the way as he simply dissolved the state government. So this also brings in the question of. Uh, stateness uh, and, and democracy. And the, and the last question that I would, uh, that I would uh, erase here is uh, it's also interesting that India in emergency was declared when uh, the ru ruling party has a majority in parliament. Uh, it's not that there was the crisis in parliament, there was any you know, shortage of MPs. And then the state actually went against the state or democracy went against democracy. It was a kind of a situation that uh, he he rightly uh, pointed out in the book, and which is which also brings in uh, the question of how we uh, explain uh, uh, when democracy democracy fails itself, or 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 the state goes against democracy, as, as Kotari said uh, long back. So these are some of the further issues which which should be taken up. Uh, uh, in, in, in future research and discussion. Uh, but uh, otherwise, I mean, as I said, it's a very majestic book, raised many competitive issues uh, for political science, competitive politics, state, state making. I mean, one can take up this issue separately, how state making occurred in Europe and in India. So it is in one book that we get all this, you know, it's like, like an ocean in, in, in terms of the issues, in terms of the documents he supplied, and in terms of his reading of the existing literature, so uh, these are some of the issues uh, which are which all cannot be settled perhaps here, but we can discuss them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Bhattacharya. <clears throat>
I have also called this book some kind of a magnum opus. It contains everything for that period and dwells into it. But you've raised some very interesting points, especially about the fact that it regulates in elections, nurtures elections, and though we continue to believe that it's the election commission which conducts the elections, law and order is also a state subject. But somewhere that octopus has its hands in the conduct of these elections. But the other point that you made is of the center formation, whether it was the Mughals or later on the British and how they could not succeed in doing it. Very interesting issues and hopefully we'll all go into it. Uh, so we've had three panelists give us a very interesting insight into what the book contains and their perceptions about it, their analysis about it. Uh, we have about 30 minutes plus, and we have some very interesting questions which have come up. The first question taking on from what I would have also wanted to, <clears throat> it be, to be discussed is, uh, given what you know about the function of the home ministry, what do you think are the consequences for Indian democracy of the ministry being held by the present home minister? Very interesting question. It's a uh, very real. And I guess three minutes by each of the three panelists on this issue would be a very interesting take. Let's take with uh, Professor Mitra. Can we start with you? Towards the end of the book, I talk about the present and I start by apologizing that what I have to say is speculative because uh, I don't have any archival evidence of what the Home Ministry advised with regard to the abrogation of Article 370 or the citizenship law or for that matter um, the um, structural reforms in agriculture or the farm laws. And I'm saying a little wistfully because we have a 30 year uh, norm. The 30 year rule says anything that is written into a file would be kept secret for 30 years. After 30 years, the file should be either destroyed or sent to the archive. So I'm saying in the book wistfully that 30 years from now, well, I'll not be there, but those who, young people who are reading the book will have an opportunity when the archives are open to see what the Home Ministry uh, did, what the Home Secretary said, and how these things were negotiated. Did they manage to find a middle ground? Then I'm saying in the book that there are two possibilities. Either the civil service has been so cowed down that they anticipate what the politicians would like to hear and give them what they would like to hear. So they did not correct, they did not inform the government, which has had to have a vote face about the unrest that will be created in the agricultural sector. Either that, or I have a very important second speculation, or the ministry did get the advice from the um, civil service that it's not a good thing to bring these laws in the farm sector so abruptly, negotiate better, but they nevertheless went ahead thinking that it would become part of a political polarization and that polarization will eventually help the party in power, the coalition in power politically. Or in other words, the decision was made not on the basis of the professional advice of the minister of the uh, civil service, but on political grounds. That is also possible. Now, why would a government do this? That is where I talk about something that is not normally talked about, that democracies are important, but democracies can handle only politics within the system, but not politics of the system. Politics within the system is Roti Kapra or Makan, who gets what and how, etc. But what is worth getting? What are the core values of the system? And can those core values be changed 
through elections. Or to put it metaphorically, can elections replace revolutions? Because after all, what India is trying to do is revolutionary. Going from a semi-feudal state to a modern state needs a revolution. But we are trying to do all that through the electoral process. So I'm talking about India's middle democracy trap that the elections will produce governments which will do both lobes and fishes of office but will also try to tinker with the system as a whole and that is where they will get into problem hoping that the problems would polarize the country even further and maybe that polarization will bring back the same government or maybe not it's a gamble now I don't think I can say any more than that, but uh, as I said, I'll leave it to young people uh, or people who have the possibility of doing interviews to find out from the civil service exactly what advice was given and then what was advice was not accepted and for what reasons. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Professor Bajpai. Yeah, I don't have any great thoughts on this. I mean, I just feel that uh, there have been times uh, already in his time as uh, Home Minister when uh, I, I noticed it particularly around the Citizenship Act, I think, um, and uh, uh, the riots in Delhi at that time. And then, uh, I, I, I don't know if you, you all recall, but uh, for a while, Amit Shah seemed to disappear. Uh, and I think that uh, my instinct is that the Prime Minister thought that it wasn't terribly well handled. Um, but, you know, I have no insider information and no confirmatory evidence. Um, my own uh, second point, the second point I would make is my own sense is that Mr. Shah is probably a, a much better political campaigner and organizer of, of uh, you know, uh, of the party and its uh, winning uh, ways and so on. Uh, I'm not, uh, I've never been quite convinced that he's a great administrator, but I could be wrong. Um, but uh, certainly, I mean, to the extent that Mr. Modi keeps winning elections and, um, and Mr. Shah is uh, his uh, trusted lieutenant, he's going to be around for a long time. So clearly he's, um, uh, I noticed, I, I did some quick calculations when I was reading the book. I mean, uh, 11 home ministers uh, account for about 50 years of, uh, you know, of the home ministership. Um, and then you have another 20 who uh, uh, took care of the home ministry for the other 27 years. So I think uh, whatever we might say, Amit Shah's tenure is going to be of some, of some time and uh, he's going to leave his mark on, on, on the home ministry and, and on uh, questions of uh, governance and order for sure. Thank you. Uh, Professor Bhattacharya, would you like to add something to yes. this? Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, <clears throat> since there is this 30 year rules, so we always have this you know, knowledge gap between actually what transpired uh, inside the ministry uh, uh, before uh, such actions were taken. But my answer would be, uh, since we do not know that, and it is impossible to know, uh, I, I think the best possible answer would be the electoral, electoral logic uh, about the abolition of Article 370. I mean, that was their electoral manifesto and the government has huge majority. So perhaps one could explain that it is implementation of their manifesto, we like it or not. Uh, and, and the farm laws, uh, it looks like it's, it's looking at the you know, up, upcoming elections uh, in, in UP, Punjab, uh, particularly in these two states. So the, that may be the logic, but we do not have the inside information beyond the electoral calculations. Thank you. Uh, well, to add my two bit to this, uh, see, no, uh, very frankly, the vibrance of the Indian democracy is actually in the hands of the voter. It's, so whether it's West Bengal, whether it's Punjab, whether it's Maharashtra, whether it's Tamil Nadu, ultimately, it, the writ, it's not the writ of the Home Ministry, the Home Minister that is run. The people have decided what they want. And that's, I think, the vibrance of the Indian democracy. You, Professor Bhattacharya, you alluded to it. The very fact, and it's being uh, 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 felt, it's being alleged 
it's being believed that the very fact that elections in these two, three states were looming in the, uh, in the very near future, the fact that this long drawn agitation by farmers had not been succumbed to by the government actually forced them to in some ways withdraw. And that's why they have been set, uh, left aside. So I think ultimately, whatever you may say about it, but the Indian vibrance of the Indian democracy is certainly in the hands of the voter. And that's where the voter has always come up, come up trumps, whether it was 1977 or now. Now, Mr. Uh, Mitra, we have a very interesting question for you now. And it says, when governance by stealth fails, it is necessary to use governance by the hammer. But once governance by the hammer is also exert, exerted, how has Indian government returned to governance by stealth? Is it possible to kind of build a bridge between the two? Professor Mitra. Um, what I have done in the book is to show what happens after major riots and how once the riot is quelled, what corrective actions are taken? Because India has this policy of a two-track strategy. Hit them hard over the head, then teach them how to play the piano. Um, which is to say, sending the paramilitary or the military, and when the trouble is quelled, it may be a secessionist movement or a riot, once the situation is stable, hold elections and let the new leadership take responsibility. And this is the Indian strategy. And this is how the system restores the culture and tradition and norms of governance by stealth. Uh, okay, that's, that's wonderful. Um, uh, you alluded to it, Professor Mitra, there's a question which directly asks you a question. It says that, could you tell us how the Indian civil service compares with the British civil service of today? Has the civil service become larger than life? Actually, um, I started out with uh, a book called The White Hall as my model, because White Hall um, is a nice fat book, uh, describes how the British civil service has grown and how it plays with the ministers and how ministers try to play with them and how this duopoly goes on. And that is where I picked up the metaphor of the, um, that, uh, that Vital uses to describe the home office as the charred lady. The charred lady in a stately home is an important person. She is not the mistress of the house, but the mistress, especially a young mistress, learn from the child lady how to run the house. Now, children are playing and things are here and there. The child lady's job is to put order back in again. But watch out. If the child lady gets too much power, then the home is not run properly. But at the same time, if a new mistress just fires the old child lady and brings in a pliant child lady, and guests arrive, nothing would be ready. So the balance is all. Is the balance still there? Is the balance still there in the United Kingdom on whose model our home ministry has grown? This is the kind of question that we should be asking. For the period that I've studied, I've seen how the civil servants, particularly in the 1950s, held their own. They start faltering a little by the 60s. And during the emergency, clearly one part of the civil service sides with the politicians. But lo and behold, once the emergency is over, the civil service is punishing their own comrades who had become renegades. So that civil service is trying to get back its own culture of neutrality. Now, I would go further and use this opportunity to respond to a point made by Kanti earlier, if I may, that post-colonial states usually have a heritage and they try to build on that heritage. But why is there a difference, which is the point that Hari Bhattacharya has made, to be a bit, bit comparative. Just look at India and Pakistan. 
both have the civil service tradition that the British left behind. Now, why did Pakistan not hold together? Why did the army run amok in East Pakistan? Why did they not continue the way India did continue? The answer to that, Kanti, would be that let us not forget the importance of the political idiom. In the same section where I am talking about the seven norms of governance by stealth, I say these norms are necessary but they are not sufficient. You still need another element which is leadership. Now India's political leadership makes a major difference to the functioning of the child lady. Because politicians like not just Nehru, Lal Bahadur Shastri who grew from below knew what the grassroots are saying and civil servants learned to respect them. That is the kind of learning. They were no longer British style pipe smoking uh, civilian uh, rulers. They had become partners. So this partnership grows and this is because India has this uh, which Pakistan did not have a kind of escalator which could pick up grassroots leaders and bring them up and the same escalator will bring down those who cease to matter. So India's elites become Indianized in a way Pakistan's political elites did not. The balance was there and this balance held. It faltered a little before the emergency. After the emergency the balance came back again <coughs> because politi politics became unstable and their civil service kept on the normal housekeeping activities. It failed again in 1984. One of my big regrets is that for 1984 anti-Sikh riots, the archive was not yet opened for that period when I was doing archival research. So anyone who is listening, please read what I have to say about the 1984 riots and then look at the archival record of what the Home Ministry did. Why did the Home Ministry fail to get the army come in and why did they allow two days of carnage to go on the anti sikh carnage. That is the bit that I would like to do if I had the chance. I already know what happened uh, at the time of the Babri mosque because God Bole, the Home Secretary uh, has written about it. See that there was one horrible night God Bole, the Home Secretary knows that there is going to be trouble on the night of the 5th of December 1992 and he is trying to contact his Home Minister, the Prime Minister, the Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh and nobody would take his call. This fellow says, writes in his book that he had 20,000 crack uh, soldiers, paratroopers ready to be dropped and keep order in Ayodhya but the Home Secretary cannot move on his own. He needs a clearance from above and this clearance would not come. By the morning, Karsabaks are at work and it's too late. The reason I've talked about it is because there were civil servants like God Bole who were right thinking but their politics failed. So the moral of the story is you need a balance of politics and the civil service. If the balance is lost, either you go the Pakistan way, civil service runs the state or you go the political way, which is how emergency was declared, which is how 1984 riots took place. So restoring the balance is the important thing. Um, if I, Mr. Chairman, if I may take one more minute here. This is again another bit which I have left unsolved in my book. And that goes back to the point that Kanti made earlier about diversity and Harir made uh, later about state politics and federalism. Now let us not forget, India develops in course of the federal evolution, states like Tamil Nadu who would like to behave that they are a state by themselves or states like West Bengal now who would like to behave like their state themselves. Their political leaders make their regional demands almost a badge of honor. So why don't they just leave? Why don't they go away? Let us not forget that the civil service, 
civil servants in Tamil Nadu and West Bengal are still part of a national cadre, which is run nationally, which is recruited nationally, and there is constant flow of information both ways. And then there are the governors, the governor has to send a report to the Home Ministry and Home Ministry then decides what kind of break to apply. So a lot of breaking and egging and breaking and egging goes on behind the scene. And that is what we would find if we look at the state archives in Chennai and Kolkata, which would be recording what the state chief secretaries, state home secretaries were doing during those times. So to pursue the questions that have been raised about what protects India's diversity, what keeps India's federalism still in place, why does it not break up? To answer this, we have to look at the state archives and pursue the same questions from different sources. Sorry, I, Chairman, I took a bit too long. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mitra, for that uh, <clears throat> very comprehensive introduction to it. Uh, there is a question which says, which I, I leave to uh, any of the three panelists to take up, that if we had to define metrics of success for the Ministry of Home Affairs, what would be the top four bullets and how have they evolved uh, or changed over history? Okay. Um, I will give one bullet, which is order. Now, Hari had made that point earlier. State formation in Europe, as we learned from Charles Tilly, uh, was contingent on war. The metaphor in, Chile, uh, in Tilly is, Charles Tilly, state makes war and war makes state. In India, I would say, state makes order and order makes state. Now, why is this a big deal for students of political science? All those like me who have done a BA in political science have been taught about the social contract that Thomas Hobbes talked about. That either you do self-help and kill one another, produce anarchy, or you sign a social contract, give up your right to self-help and let the state carry the monopoly of legitimate violence and under the authority of the state, there will be uh, order. There will be, life will be orderly. Not solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short, but civilization will flourish. That's how we have been taught. Here is the puzzle. Do people, rational actors, rationally decide to come together and produce a state and order or is order necessary for people to be able to make that rational decision. The, this is the chicken and egg relationship between stateness and orderliness. State makes order and order makes state. Look at Kashmir, you would understand what I am talking about. Now that is the message that the Home Ministry has made into a part of the political culture of India and order by itself is valued. You know by whom? the poorest, because they are the ones who are subject to local satraps, local gundas. So anyone who can guarantee order would have some loyalty. And that is one of the contributions. And if I may, Chairman, if I may give one more bullet, this is my second one, legitimacy. Now, Home Ministry and legitimacy and uh, the current Home Minister was mentioned earlier. When you look at his face, you don't necessarily think about legitimacy. So why am I talking about legitimacy? That takes me back to the archives. Now, which government in his right mind will write into a file things which are incriminating and then put it for public display? Does archive making make sense? To that, I found a wonderful answer, which is states make archives, but archives make the state. Archives are a way for the state to profile itself, to produce a written track of what it is about, so that it will become part of the common common sense 
or to legitimize its power. And that is where the Home Ministry has understood that norms matter, legitimacy matters, archives matter, and keeping order, keeping the public space open also matters, which is the point that Harir made earlier about the contribution of the Home Ministry to holding elections. Just think of Indira Gandhi and 1976 announcing elections. Indira thought the crops are good, rain has been good, and people love me and I'll win. She organizes elections. How many people remember that the elections were organized still while emergency was on and these elections defeated Indira Gandhi? Now, who took care of those elections? Who ran it orderly? This is my second bullet. I have a couple more bullets, but maybe I'll leave it to the other two panelists. But if not, I'll come back. Thank you. And a repeat of that in the 2004 elections also, which were advanced by the government then. Uh, any other yes. panelists would like to add a bullet to it? May, well, I mean, may. I would just say, I guess I said that uh, uh, the issue of diversity, which the book uh, uh, deals a lot with, is a great accomplishment. And even if democracy were to be uh, abridged and damaged uh, in India, uh, and I keep an open mind on that because there are signs uh, of that, but I think um, this managing the diversity issue will still remain. And I suspect that, you know, that's something that the Home Ministry might still be able to, uh, to keep going, whatever the next uh, political system uh, we get. Um, so I would say, you know, managing our diversity has been very important. I think the other is uh, managing such a huge range of agencies, you know, from intelligence to CRPF to police to quasi-intelligence to the civil service itself. Uh, and as uh, uh, Subrata said, the politicians um, and uh, uh, then, you know, uh, rival uh, departments, as it were. I mean, particularly, I wonder what the relationship is to the PMO and how it's dealt with the PMO. Is it really just a, an acting arm of the PO, PMO or does it actually uh, sometimes push back and, and uh, uh, do things more independently? But managing that great diversity of the Indian state. And of course, uh, uh, back to the, the issue of federalism, then the Home Ministry, you know, dealing with agencies at the, at the uh, state level um, without overstepping its bounds and so on. So I think uh, those two, two areas of management, the ethnic diversity of India, and then these, this enormous range of government agencies and departments uh, that it must work with, uh, sometimes manage, um, that's, those are impressive. I think I would put those down as, if, if they can continue to do that, uh, then that's, that's vital and, and would be, would be, you know, uh, would be a, a two tick mark for it. Professor Bhattacharya, well, you want to yeah, say something? Well, uh, yes, uh, I have very, very, yes. Uh, if I have understood the question correctly, I think uh, th there are already you know, certain measurements, empirical measurements of order uh, or legitimacy, uh, which we, we have used myself and Professor, Professor Mitro too. Uh, and the data collected uh, are from the uh, Ministry of Home Affairs, uh, crime, uh, crime, uh, crime Bureau, and they are published nowadays online too as as um, crime in India, uh, different yeah. volumes. And there, there are two very vital statistical uh, measurement. One is the you know riot per million population, and murder also per million population. And riot, not in the ordinary sense of the term, riots in terms of the definition given by in, uh, I, I, IRPC. Uh, yes. So these are the two vital you know, matrix, mat, mat, matrix which uh, are used uh, in, in, in empirical research in, in measuring uh, uh, political order and, and governance. Although nowadays other factors have come into the play uh, in defining governance. What Mitro has been talking about and has also talked at length in his book is mostly political dimensions of governance, but nowadays uh, other, other dimensions have also come into the picture like the service delivery, uh, delivery of services of different kinds. Uh, but in this respect, in terms of political governance, 
I would emphasize this. I would uh, ask the you know, students and researcher to look at uh, the crime in India volume to measure uh, the kind of you know, order, kind of violence, what kind of violence they have classified violence in different ways. So they will get the statistical information of the matrix of uh, governance uh, or, or the success of our ministry. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, we have any number of questions more, and but that's typical of the Home Ministry. You know, uh, we could have carried on this debate, uh, this discussion, so rich in a large number of ways, for another one hour. And I, yet, I don't think we would be satisfied all the questions uh, that keep coming in. So, uh, but we are running out. We run out of time, and uh, it's typical of the Minister of Home Affairs that more is unsaid than is said about it more is below the surface than it is above the ground as far as this ministry is concerned. Uh, there is more fear than the, it is revered, this ministry. Uh, <clears throat> fact also remains uh, that uh, we are hoping that whether it's Professor Mitra or anybody else, they will carry on and give us uh, some narrative over the, what has happened over the last 20 odd years. Uh, Professor Mitra, Thank you very much for this very wonderful book in a large number of ways, which is a magnum opus on this ministry. Nobody has been able to put together all the facts and things as you have been able to do. I'm very grateful to Professor Bajpai and Professor Bhattacharya for having dwelt at length in all the discussions and having enriched the discussions as of today. I'm sure if we had to get together some other time somewhere, there will be so much more to discuss. So thank you very much for this entire thing. Uh, I'll hand you back to Claudia. Claudia, all yours. Thank you, Mr. Rai. On behalf of ISAS, we would like to extend a special thanks to Professor Mitra for today's book discussion and our two panelists for the engaging discussion. This brings the event today to an end. We thank all our participants for the participation and we look forward to being with you at future ISAS events. Thank you. Good evening. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you very much.